welcome into Full Screen Podcast, your one-stop shop into demystifying streaming and tech and pop culture. I'm your host, Kira Astor, and once again, I'm super excited to be hanging out with all of you today. Joining me today is my co-host, my partner in crime, in this realm and the shadow realm, the person who enjoys a demented letterbox review as much as I do. It's Raven <laughs> Ebert. Hello, Raven. How are you? Hi, everyone. I am certified fresh today. How's everyone doing? <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful to have you. Wonderful to see you on this beautiful Saturday looking certified fresh. <laughs> Thank you. you. I yeah, wore red, so I look like a fresh tomato. I'm keeping yes. it in speed. Listeners should know that she's uh, wearing red, rocking this beautiful red dress. <laughs> um, as you know, I just got back from Costa Rica, and I'm really feeling that Pura Vida life, that pure life, mm. not letting it go. So yeah, speaking of pure life, today's topic is giving me a lot of life. So tell the, tell the good people what we're talking about today, Raven. Ooh, a very, very timely topic indeed. Today we are talking about review aggregators online specifically and how it has been affecting not only the way that movies are made, but audiences responding to what we're putting out in the film and television sphere. You know, there are so many different changes in the way that media is consumed but I think the biggest change of all is how much younger the demographics are becoming I think in the last count around uh, 43% of audiences were between the ages of 18 to 49 so basically more and more people within the audiences are getting internet savvy and um, everybody has something to say and I think that is a general through line in all consumer mindset. When we consume something, we want to tell people about the experience because it's a factor when other people are looking for the same experience or uh, the same product, you know, whether it comes to apps on the Play Store or restaurants on like Maps and Yelp and other applications like that. You have even like websites like Angie's List that rate people who come work in your house, your contractors and stuff like that. So yeah, rating people, it it is not just like a a disgusting frat boy thing for girls. It is actually a way uh, we're slowly becoming that Black Mirror episode. So it's a very timely topic (laughs) to talk about because uh, I think review bombing as a term has come into the modern lexicon of media consumption. And I'm really excited to talk about it and to get into how this is affecting, you know, audiences and how their media literacy is affecting the way that movies are being made. It's an interesting time in this art form. Yes. It's a, it's a meaty topic, right? It's a ratings. Wow. Um, one thing I'd like to add to what Raven just said here is that we don't understand how ratings are calculated, right? Like we don't know, like it's very murky. We just take them at face value, but do we understand them as a species, as a people? And, you know, like there's a couple things happening. We see this phenomenon more and more critical ratings deviating from the popular opinion and the performance at the box office more and more. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that there's, there's a natural and acceptable and understandable expanding divide happening between the critical circuit, our film journalists and the gen pop, you know, the normal spectator, or does this mean that the ratings, the way the ratings are calculated, shown, determined are flawed? Yeah, we went there. (laughs) We're going there. (laughs) And so, yeah, we are, you know, we are going to talk a little bit about three blockbuster movies this year uh, that have, for which the ratings have been very not good (laughs) uh, this year. Uh, So Mm -hmm. The Gray Man, Thor, Love and Thunder, and Jurassic World, no colon, Dominion. Jurassic World, Dominion. No colon. And... No colon. Wait, how does the movie poop if it doesn't have any colon? 
love, love this. <laughs> and, you know, we love movies here at the pod, obviously, but we also love tech. So to neatly tie it all together to what uh, Raven mentioned, we're going to talk, dive deep into four popular ratings platforms, Rotten Tomatoes, Cinema Score, Letterboxd, and IMDb why we count on them so much and their history, their main objective, the tech behind them, how reliable they are, all that good stuff. So yeah, and with that, we will quickly cover how you can get in touch with us. So Raven, tell the the people about social media. Absolutely. Um, Both on Instagram and Twitter, you can follow us at fullscreen underscore pod. We also have our YouTube channel, Full Screen Podcast. And we have our email address, fullyscreened at gmail.com. Feel free to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on our social media, and drop us a comment, leave us a like, and uh, let us know what you want us to tackle. I think we have a lot of things that we want to get through, but we'd love to be able to cater to our listening audience and address some of the questions that y'all have around the role tech plays in media. And it doesn't have to be about movies and TV. Sometimes we can deviate into how, for example, tech has been affecting print media as well. So we would love to hear your feedback. And just don't be mean, guys. Like, if you're doing all (laughs) caps, um, I'm deleting it. I, I really have no patience for just people telling me that I suck. I know I suck. Um... And I'm here to fully embrace that. Like Prima about... sucks kind of way? <laughs> exactly. Like Prima sucks kind of way. And it's like, I suck. And that's how, you know, the good Lord made me. So deal with it. And if you do have specific things that you want us to dive into that we kind of skimmed over in previous episodes, let us know because we are considering kind of putting out shorter, quicker bites about topics that we kind of touched on but didn't get to go into a lot so let us know if that's something that interests you awesome all right perfect let's get started all right welcome into the multiplying genre Today, we're going to talk about three of the biggest blockbusters on streaming or theatrical this summer, kind of springy as well, (laughs) and how the mismatch between their ratings and reviews and performance at the box office ties into our ratings platform discussion later on. The three movies in question today are The Gray Man, Jurassic World, No Colon Dominion, and Thor Love and Thunder. All right. Let's chat. First up, Ryan Reynolds in a tracksuit. Wait. Did I say Reynolds Reynolds again? Yes. It's It's Gosling. Gosling. It's hard. (laughs) It's hard, guys. They're both from Canada. They're both Ryans. But very different. Um, Only one is an Academy Award nominated actor. Reynolds, you mean? The owner of (laughs) Wrexham United. No, only one of them is an Academy Award nominated actor who inspired like an entire generation of men to wear like scorpion jackets and not talk. Real talk, I have that pin on my that, that yeah, with the, the knife do. and the jacket. Uh, it's great. And we anyway, why you watch that movie, Oscar Isaac? <laughs> for sure, for sure, Moon Knight, Ryan. Gosling in a tracksuit. Careful. Spoilers ahead. All right, let's let's talk about background of Gray Man quickly. So directed and written by Anthony and Joe Russo, my beloved directors of many, many evergreen episodes of Community and, and also of Captain America Civil War, Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame, all that good stuff. MCU. And Arrested Development. Yes, they've, they've got quite a quite a portfolio. It, they produced this movie as well. Their production company is called Agbo, A-G-B-O, which also produced features like 21 Bridges and Extraction, which guys, if you haven't seen 21 Bridges, watch it ASAP. 
That movie goes hard. Love it. Mm. This film stars Ryan Gosling. Gosling. The good one. Ana de Armas. Don't at me. Um, no, I think that that's the popular opinion, hopefully. Ana de Armas, Chris Evans, Rega John Page, and Billy Bob Thornton. Music is done by Henry Jackman, who's most known for some Disney animated features like Big Hero 6 and Wreck-It Ralph. And also X-Men First Class, which, again, I'm going to say this, don't at me, it's the least good of all the modern X-Men movies. My heart hurts. (laughs) Cinematography is done by Steven Winden, who's basically the DP on all of Fast and Furious movies and a close partner of director Justin Lin. It's one of the most... (laughs) <laughs> it's one of the most expensive movies ever made by Netflix Studios with a budget of 200 million. And a little bit more data, this movie was streamed for a total of 89 million hours globally in its first 3 days, which would equal around 44 million viewers. I don't think that's an official count. I think it's an estimate of the viewers. And then this is the fourth most popular of all time uh, on Netflix original movies circuit, only topped by Red Notice, Don't Look Up, and Bird Box, which they're all oh, real bad, no. y'all. <laughs> oh, no. It's just not working. <laughs> One day, Reed Hastings will be up there claiming an Oscar for a Netflix original movie. It's not today. <laughs> It's not working. Well, it's not going to be in this list because I loved Mank and I loved The Irishman and they're not on this list. Mm -hmm. Um, I also loved Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and that was an excellent film and it's not on this list either. That's crazy. Yes, hopefully. So there's two upcoming that have my interest, my complete attention, which Glass Onion, the Knives Out sequel, will be Netflix, on Netflix sometime mm-hmm. later this year. And Nicholas Winding Refn, our beloved director of Drive, Ryan Gosling. Ryan uh, is making, Gosling. <laughs> he's making the Copenhagen Cowboy, which just vibes are immaculate. Looks great. Um, so hopefully with those, Netflix's luck changes. But all right, let's talk about Gray Man's ratings, why we're here. So Rotten Tomatoes, 46% critics, 90% audience. Less than 50% critics and then 90% audience. IMDb is a lukewarm 6.5. Cinema score, none since this polls theatrical audiences and moviegoers and streaming space lacks this rating. Letterboxd is 2.5 out of 5. Good stuff. So let's get to what the plot is actually about. Adapted from the book series of the same name by Mark Greeny, the story follows a prisoner and later CIA covert assassin, Sierra Six, or Cortland Gentry, Court Gentry, as he uncovers a vast conspiracy within the agency and races through time and different continents to save his maybe daughter figure and find out the truth. I mean, it's all very confusing, and this happens as an equally capable but morally devoid Boston man is on his trail. So let me get to some of my likes in this movie. The most enjoyable part was getting to watch Reggae Jean Page do his best American accent with the crazy R's. Dormammu, I have come to bargain. <laughs> Going real hard. Yeah, the the English always goes for the R's and uh, Irish go for the N sounds. Like I remember seeing Jamie Dornan struggle to say gun without going gun, um, like the Irish accent. And then, of course, the Australians have to, like, bring it down to just saying, like, one syllable. Like, their no is, like, five syllables long. So we say no, and they go, no. So. Much love to the Irish, the Aussies, 
everyone. Accents are hard. That's why we need accent coaches. Okay, loved uh, another thing I loved, Ana de Armas. Can't go wrong. Loved her, loved her flower suit, loved her insta ready hair that doesn't change as she's fighting. It's just like perfect hairspray, perfect mousse usage. It's wonderful. And uh, the high choreography of, of fight scenes, right? This is where Su- Russo's excel. Planes, trains, cars, the fights are just beautiful and magnetic to look at. And overall, I'd say that it was a thrill to watch. It was a thrill to watch this as you're doing your household chores, you know? You're like folding your laundry, cooking some pasta on like a day off and just pressing Every pause. Every filmmaker's and, and... dream. <gasps> I made this movie so that people could make their pasta without, you know, thinking about um <laughs> depressing thoughts instead they could just you know watch hot guys being chased on motorbikes i'm presuming i don't know <laughs> planes trains and automobiles like you said it's yeah. just um something uh, moving violence Listen, on this public is why transit. christopher nolan loves streaming christopher Lo- nolan as we know is a big fan oh yeah, of yeah oh yeah he big up streaming all the time <laughs> um and then be- like great lines that are said throughout the movie one of my favorites is uh catch that ken doll which chris evans says about ryan gosling which... Ryan gosling who's playing ken in the barbie movie yes, yes. i was reminded uh... by you yes beautiful beautiful reference That's right um it's like yeah we know I... what our careers are doing what's up and, and and you know Russo's added that to be like, we, we're aware of pop culture and we're going to add this in so you know that we are. Or maybe they're trying to imply that Ryan Gosling has no genitalia. Impossible. <laughs> I hope that it's... it's I mean, he has a child, so... Yeah. Is it his? No, you. okay. We're not going no, it, there. We love Whoa! <laughs> wow! <laughs> Lord, Lord, already off the off the off the track. No, the let's get back on track. The views of Kira Astor do not reflect the views <laughs> of Full Screen Podcast. Any assumptions that Kira Astor makes on the legitimacy of the Gosling monarchy, Mendes, <laughs> the Gosling Mendes uh, monarchy line. Yeah, we love them. Okay, so let's get to let's get to the stranger stuff in this movie that possibly reflects where, you know, the ratings are crazy on this one. So the casual mention of Captain Rogers, I mean this morally devoid Boston man, Lloyd Hansen, which guys, the names are just top notch. You're repeating in this movie. yourself. Morally devoid equals Boston man. <laughs> Like the views of Raven <laughs> do not reflect. <laughs> but they do, they do, they totally do. Um, just <laughs> kidding, Boston. Um, I don't like the Patriots as a former resident of Atlanta. But uh, yeah, Chris Evans being Boston, I think he's he's shining, isn't he? Is as he's shining, um, pulling out that Boston accent on interview trails for Lightyear. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. He's having fun. Yeah, like as as Shawnee McIrish. What's his name? Sorry, what is his name? (laughs) (laughs) Lloyd Hansen. Oh, okay. That's less ethnic. All right. Uh, he has this horrible little mustache with just like, and he has like, you know, he, Captain Rogers has perfect teeth. And the way the mustache highlights his his smile is just very not working. It's real bad. It's just very like rodent. Just mustache, no beard. Just mustache. Very clean shaven, okay. very particular about his look and just the little mustache and mm, just no. Would a thin mustache have worked for you? Like an actual like a villain mustache that the mustache twirling like villain... twirl yeah listen listen would that no. do it for you okay no right <laughs> okay keep him keep him a little keep him clean shaven you know like they're going for that look of of that that this guy is very particular 
about his mm-hmm. appearance, how he approaches things. Um, I would have liked the clean shaven look, but you know, it's uh, yeah. Or Not like a Steven Seagal goatee. Henry Cavill. Oh, his mustache uh, is famous. <laughs> oh, he look he he's working it. Um, all right. So anyway, this character, Lloyd Hansen, is a established as a, is introduced to us as a Harvard football player turned CIA assassin who doesn't play by the rules. <laughs> Which who's writing this? Like, listeners, please is correct this... us if this is actually established in the book by Mark Greeny, or is this something the Russos did? I don't think so. I mean, come on. Like, this is a 14-year-old girl on Wattpad. He's a, a, <laughs> a quarterback from Harvard who is in the CIA. Like, this is the type of um, adult spy novel that I would have written for people to buy before they boarded a plane if I was a 14-year-old <laughs> girl who didn't live in the United States as I was. Cause I was like, yeah, I know Harvard. That's a, that's a, that's a college and they do the football and uh, they do do the football. There's weird things like, you know, other weird things like a character early on that says to Sierra six, who's Ryan Gosling as he's dying, he says, give him hell six, which makes you feel nothing. Nada, zero, zip, shunya, like nothing. It's just wait, his name is there. Sierra Six. His name is Sierra Six. This Courtland is Gentry's a... name is Sierra Six. His name is Courtland Gentry and Sierra Six. Sierra Six is his covert operative name. Yeah, yeah, for the Sierra um, program. Yeah, this is this. Uh, I would like to sue Netflix because they took my. 2004 life journal pages and turned it into a oh, life journal a novel and put it on netflix and i haven't seen a single cent of this 200 million dollars because my self-insert Cortland gentry who was a woman um got turned into ryan gosling i'm okay with that but i would like to see this money 14 year old me put a lot of work <laughs> into <laughs> writing about the adventures Seriously, if anyone has written like a similar Wattpad or like live journal story, guys, yeah. you know, check check in on this. This is Wattpad um, for boys. Like it really <laughs> reeks of Wattpad for boys. There's was uh, it there's was it we- Billy Bob Thornton that was like give him hell? No, <laughs> that's no, such he's a actually Billy Bob decent line. in the movie. He was a very he was very like he, just very doesn't do much he's the lawyer who recruits sierra six in the movie and then that's really it um yo billy bob is a lawyer (laughs) (laughs) it's just it's it's all kinds of weird choices there's ear torture there's bombs made in drain pipes in a homemade underground prison lip gloss touch-ups during interrogations lots of big bold title cards you know russos love them and Who's putting on like the lip you, gloss? Is it it's, Ryan Gosling? It's Lloyd Hansen. <laughs> no, oh. no, it's Lloyd Hansen. Just like showing how smarmy of a bastard he is. He's putting on lip gloss. Like not lip balm, lip gloss. This is a groundbreaking movie. I It might be lip balm, but like he's just like, you know, oh, like then it's pursing not. his lips and like there's a close up of this. The whole thing is. Hey, just- Lloyd, you know what would make your lips less chapped? If you were clean shaven, buddy, think about it. <laughs> and then we see, yeah, big, beautiful title cards of ex- in of exotic places. But these are actually we don't get to see like beautiful Bond esque locations. We see hotel rooms or a street corner in like Prague or Budapest somewhere. So it's surprise. Very- it's not Prague. It's Atlanta. Woo! My, yeah, it, and I I don't want to harp on this too much. It might be like COVID regulations that they had to do this, but come on. It's Russo's. They love Atlanta. As in they, Prague has COVID regulations and Atlanta is like, what COVID? What COVID? <laughs> yeah, COVID doesn't exist. It has never existed. In, in yeah, COVID. in Atlanta where The Walking Dead was shot. Mm. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> Sorry, that got bleak real fast. But it is, as people who lived in Atlanta, it's always fun where right? they're like, yeah, I'm in New York. And you're like, no, no, that's Piedmont, baby. <laughs> And yeah, so one last thing I have at the end of my notes is in all caps, so many stars and for what? (laughs) So at the end of the day, pretty mid-tier, pretty enjoyable in parts, some very stunning photography during, you know, the fight scenes, as I mentioned, gives you a little dose of the summer thriller, summer crime uh, in, in the comfort of your home. We'll see... There's been a lot of, obviously, ratings and and a lot of feedback about how majority of this movie didn't work. And we'll see Uh how it does in the sequel, because the sequel is already in the works with the same cast, same creators, I believe, uh, as well. So, yeah, to be seen. All right, we ready to move on to the world of dinosaurs. Yeah, I have to say, I commemorate your bravery in watching, like, this one and the next one, because they have dad movie vibes, you know, you hang out with your dad, and he's like, let's go watch a movie, and you're like, um, what do I watch with my dad? And it's mm. either, like, The Gray Man or our next um, Poop Deficient movie, or poof sufficient movie, I guess, depending on your review on it. Um, so I want to hear it's... about dinosaur shenanigans right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we, like we, we hear talk about streaming a lot. This dad genre is, uh, first of all, I think it should be a tag in, in Netflix that shows up, you know, like. Like an official genre like swoon worthy, Like swoon worthy and yeah. dad crime novels or whatever, because it's paying off. Yeah. There's a lot of content around this. Yeah. You know, like how you watch like a Nancy Myers movie with your mom. Um, you watch one of these with your dad. It's like Happy Father's Day. I got yes. you beer and the gray man. Jack Reacher. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's a lot of like it's literally just fantasy fulfillment, right? Like moms want to live in a beach house and have a hot dude, and dads want to be a spy that's getting paid to overthrow democratically elected governments. <laughs> Oh, dreams. All right, all right, let's move on to Jurassic World Dominion. So a little background on this is that it's the third in the modern adaptation of the hallowed uh, Jurassic Park franchise. Um, this is the Jurassic World franchise. Mm-hmm. And this is directed by Colin Trevorrow, who wrote the second one, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, uh, which... Yeah. Did he direct the first one too, like Jurassic World? Did he direct the first one? I, you know, he might have. I don't, I'm not 100% sure. He's yeah. very involved with this franchise. Like, he's yeah. very, it's like all in. This yeah. guy, Colin. And, and the, these have nothing to do with like the Michael Crichton novels, right? Like, those were. I don't think so. I do not think so. I think they're doing, they try to do this. I mean, they're, we'll, we'll get to it, but um, whatever they're doing, it's has not been working, y'all. But distributed by Universal Pictures, and speaking of not working, maybe, maybe we're wrong because it grossed over 90, 990 million worldwide. So almost shy of a billion mark, which it might have crossed by now. These numbers are maybe from last month. Um, And this is the highest grossing, second highest grossing movie right after Top Gun Maverick, which already crossed the 1 billion threshold. So money-wise, doing real well. Music is by Michael Giacchino, most notably of the Lost series fame, and also did a uh, very small, very, very just, you may not have heard of this movie, The Batman with our bats. (laughs) Great score. We Bat love, pat, we love to see pat. Nirvana. Bat pat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Michael G. Kino, thriving right now. Also doing Spider-Man really, No Way Home. He can really like elevate a movie with his music. If you cry during those first four minutes of Up, um, the animation is beautiful, yes, but it's also Michael Giacchino's score. Like, yeah, he he's... is 
an extremely talented composer who sometimes is used to serve um, not so great movies. I have many feelings about Star Trek Into Darkness, and I really, really think that it was his score that made me enjoy the movie the first time around. Yeah, he's a frequent collaborator with J.J. Abrams and subsequently also Matt Reeves. Like he's he hangs with that gang. Yeah. Yeah, I sighed at J.J. Abrams, but okay. Okay. Great, great. Girl, you and me both. (laughs) Girl, you and me both. So cinematography by John Schwartzman, who won an Oscar for Seabiscuit. So fun fact. All right, so ILM handled the VFX with um, some creature work, uh, ILM being Industrial Light and Magic. And however, this movie or this franchise has a history of relying on animatronics to provide the real feel on set, get yeah. like, the emotions out of actors. So definitely, we, we love that here. We appreciate and support that here. Yeah, there's a, a legend within the industry, Stan Winston, who did the work on the very first Jurassic Park movie. Mm, he was also yes. responsible for the work on James Cameron's Terminator movies. So he was the touchstone of practical effects. And um, after his passing, it's been like a fight to keep his legacy alive and that legacy of, you know, having animatronics and performances that um, actors can actually react to rather than just CG. Like, I think Jurassic Park is super famous for being a CG movie, but it's like kind of minimal on that. It's all these practical effects, like the T-Rex and stuff. So it's cool to see that that's still being done in this... um, in this movie that has grossed like the GDP of a small nation, like many God, small damn. nations, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, they also have paleontologists on the on the payroll, so th- they were brought on board to advise. Really, how a particular right? I mean. Where else do you think the money's going? <laughs> Maybe the actor's paycheck. I'm glad the paleontologists are getting money from somewhere. Like, Listen, yes. Good do, for them. Do your thing, paleontologists. I do want to read this quote because I love it. I love it so much. And it says a lot about just the, the state of this movie, the state of this franchise. So in May 2015, Trevorrow told Uproxx, quote, I think this is one of those franchises like Mission Impossible and like what they're currently doing with Star Wars that is going to really benefit from new voices and new points of view. So how much do you think he freaked out after watching The Rise of Skywalker? A lot, because he was supposed to be directing the third movie. So take that, new voices. They were like, yeah, we saw your voice, man. Um, We're bringing back Jar Jar Abrams. Which, which, hmm. But you saw the movie, so you tell me how much it made your eyes roll into the back of your head. Yeah. I'll talk about that. I did not finish the movie. I gotta be real about that. It's well, just that's, your re- that's your review right there. Yeah. I watched <laughs> so my Jackie review Bar- is, I checked out. I, I pieced out. 75%. Of, I watched 80-ish percent, and then I was like, you know what? I'll Wikipedia the rest. I get it. I get what's happening. I, I get the vibes. Um, yeah, with that, let's talk about ratings real quick, right? <laughs> After my review. Rotten Tomatoes. Y'all, Rotten Tomatoes, 29% critics, 77% audience. Woo! IMDb, 5.7. <laughs> Cinema score, A-. minus. Okay, okay. Letterbox, 2.4 out of 5. So, yeah, you're, you're, you're seeing that. You're seeing the yeah. ratings being all so, over the place. Cinema score tells me that the audiences were like, yup, this is what I was expecting. So <laughs> let's talk what the st- talk about what the story is actually about. So this story occurs a few years after the event of Fallen Kingdom and the destruction of the Isla Nublar in Costa Rica. Dinosaurs are now just hanging out with humans in the world. So we see Owen and Claire, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard, are back in a relationship somehow, living in this remote cabin and... 
hunting and collecting wood and foraging. It's keep it warm. It's very, it's very beautiful, very visually stunning, very cozy. And the plot of the movies, they embark on a rescue mission for their, again, maybe daughter pattern being established here. Um, they want to rescue their baby daughter from a large evil scientific corporation named Biosyn. Uh, as our great esteemed originals Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, and Ian Malcolm, Sam Neill, Laura Dern, Jeff Goldblum, they're reunited in a quest against a global famine caused by comically large locusts. Locusts. Yeah. How how big are they? Comically Roll large big. as in. I mean, they're like not a- comical in the fact, like, if you saw them and you're going about your day grocery shopping and you saw them, yeah, that's a horror movie right there. So the highlight of the movie is definitely Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum, and Laura Dern, you know, the originals coming together. Genuine treat, honestly, to see to see these three again. Um, a delightful moment when Laura Dern, Dr. Ellie Sattler, uh, says that Ian Malcolm, Jeff Goldblum slid into her DMs and they've been in touch. And the way Laura Dern says slid into her DMs is just just chef's kiss. Just incredible. So in this script, she says slid into her DMs. There's horse-sized locusts. And the evil company is called Biosyn. Biosyn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, I just just want to tell everybody here. If you see job applications and you're telling yourself, oh, I'm not qualified, shoot your shot. Because <laughs> Colin did. <laughs> honestly, you're the ones holding yourself back, really. Like, apply for everything, like, randomly, indiscriminately. It's, you know, totally possible to get something that you're not qualified for, just as an aside. Biosyn. I mean, this is really um this is really draining funny. the well of its creativity, huh? <laughs> mm. I mean, they added, you know, they they were like, let's keep it real. Let's add the Y. Biosyn. I can't even. Um anyway, with all before we get to more of more of our what we didn't like, what I didn't like is I definitely have to give a shout out to the you know, what Grey Man lacked, I think this movie kind of made up for, which is the beautiful, stunning visuals, just like the large vistas of, of you know, the mountains of California, like the, the way dinosaurs are, are honestly present in this movie for like 10-ish minutes of this movie, 15 maybe. And there's this like beautiful sequence, which is actually very Bond-esque, is um, Owen, Chris Pratt on a bike, I think in Italy, where dinosaurs or T-Rexes are chasing him. Um, beautifully done, kind of kind of a thrill to watch it. Um, and they, they know what they're giving the audience. They, they linger on this scene, they make the chase scene very beautiful. So yeah, so that's things I like. Now... Let's get to why I, I couldn't, couldn't Let's go get on to the next five-hour portion of what you didn't like. <laughs> Y'all, as much as I love Bryce Dallas Howard and Laura Dern, this movie, I'm going to be honest, did, yeah, did not, did not work overall. Once again, science capitalism is out of control. I mean, we see, yeah, they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And, <laughs> <laughs> it's like and then, they... They take the original message, dilute it so that it doesn't actually offend people Anyone. with money. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean like money, money, like Jeff Bezos will come out of this movie and be like, that was great. Maybe I should buy Universal Pictures next. I can't. I can't even. Um what else? Yes. So there's there's yeah, there's like the, See, this science corporation seems to be using the dinosaurs and the cloned kid, which who is the daughter of, 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 you know, adopted daughter of Owen and Claire to make giant locusts. It's just like all very confusing and it just doesn't make sense. And I honestly don't care to understand more, but wait a I'm minute. Are you talking dinosaurs. about like a human locust hybrid? 
Is that what they're doing? So I think they're, so this, I, I won't get into it, Raven, but this No, get into kid, it. This sounds sick. This kid is actually asexually created by another scientist we met in Fallen Kingdom. This, this, the daughter, the adopted daughter. And her DNA is the key to either making, actually, either making the locusts or actually eradicating the locusts. I don't, I don't know. I do want to sum up the movie in Variety's, Variety wrote this uh, in their review for the movie. Quote, of the three Jurassic World movies, Dominion is the least silly and most entertaining. So yeah, there we are. That was uh, least Jurassic silly. World. Yeah. I, can't, I disagree. There's horse-sized locusts in this, guys. What are you <laughs> talking about? Have you seen Fallen Kingdom? <laughs> I haven't. And that may be the most silly, but the first one wasn't like silly. It was just... Oh, I guess it was kind of silly. Like listen, everybody... don't I, like they all blend together for me. I just remember no, no, beautiful that, dinosaurs. That first one was memorable because Bryce Dallas Howard was running in heels. Do you remember that controversy? <gasps> oh. Bryce, when... you don't need this franchise. You're a badass director just crushing the game, Bryce. No. All right. So let's talk MCU's Thor Love and Thunder. Let's talk development and background. So after the resounding and an unexpected, I would say, success of 2017's Thor Ragnarok, director Taika Waititi renewed not only the audience interest in this character, but the Marvel execs interest in this character uh, and Chris Hemsworth as well, who wanted to leave MCU behind for other projects after Avengers, not Endgame, Infinity War, one of them. Produced by Kevin Feige, as all of the MCU is, and uh, executive MCU executive Brad Winderbaum. The film was filmed in the film was filmed in Fox Studio Australia, Fox Studios Australia, with Christian Bale, y'all, signing mm. off the villain in twenty twenty. Ah, incredible. So it's written by Taika Waititi and Jennifer Robinson. And Waititi, fun fact, consider the, considers this his first romance, romantic movie, romance adjacent movie. Very lovely. Yeah. Uh, James Gunn was brought on as a consultant on the film because of the involvement of Guardians of the Guardians of the Galaxy and the simultaneous guardians 3 production going on uh at the same time so that's pretty fun we love james gunn we also must always 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 credit the talented comic book writers that are behind these beautiful stories um and this story was based on largely based on jason aaron's mighty thor comic run where dr jane foster becomes becomes the mighty thor not thor a version of Thor, the mighty Thor. Guess who, guess who did the music? <laughs> who? Michael Giacchino. <laughs> He's thriving. He is thriving. Interesting. Because um, the last one was done by Mark Mothersbaugh, who is the lead singer of the band Devo. The same guy behind oh, Whip It, yeah. Whip It Good, Into Shape. Oh. Uh, Ooh, you know the guys with the weird hats yeah yes he yes. is busy with the television show what we do in the shadows so he's being hell yes <laughs> he's being otherwise occupied by other taika projects but yeah they're frequent collaborators so i guess it kind of makes sense that yeah they had to get another person to do the score totally and michael giacchino honestly not free you guys just like very busy right now but good for him uh, photography done by Kiwi Baz Idoin, Idoin, who is a frequent collaborator with Australian Greg Fraser, our Lord and Savior on planet Arrakis. Hell yeah. Um, ILM again handled the stagecraft VFX piece of this, so Industrial Light and Magic, which we'll talk about more, especially this uh, topic momentarily. Let's get to ratings. So 65% critics, 
77% audience. This is the third lowest MCU entry ever, only behind Thor The Dark World, which was the second Thor, and Eternals. Made by Oscar winner Chloe Zhao, but one of the lowest rated. IMDb ratings are 6.7, Cinema Score B+, and Letterboxd 3.5 out of 5. All right, let's get to the plot. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so Thor Love and Thunder starts out with as Guardians of the Galaxy, the Guardians of the Galaxy and our wonderful Asgard um, God of Thunder. Asgard. Thor. <laughs> yeah. This is literally what Jeff Goldblum says in the movie. Mm, you want to get um, back to ass place? Mm. <laughs> Thor is hanging out with the Guardians in the beginning of the movie, but it's established very quickly But he that he's not feeling any sort of inner peace. He's searching, because he's lost so much, he's searching for more meaning in his life. Uh, and he goes on a quest uh, to find fulfillment in New Asgard, on earth which is norway somewhere around there and he finds his scientist x xgf jane foster natalie portman who did not who did not return for ragnarok she was done with mcu at that point but she's come back for this one back for seconds baby and she is a thor he notices immediately that she is a thor obviously hard to miss and she has his hammer mjolnir Mew Mew, as Darcy, Kat Denning says, Mew Mew. And this makes, there's a beautiful, actually really funny arc where his current lover, his axe, Stormbreaker, is jealous of of him pining <laughs> a- after <laughs> Mjolnir. Uh, so there's a very, there's an arc of the ex Mjolnir and the current lover stormbreaker the axe um which is actually pretty funny very taika we are also introduced to scene chewing christian bale just incredible who plays gore the god butcher and who's vowed in this movie to kill all gods because reasons and we see valkyrie tessa thompson korg director taika waititi and the mighty thor jane partner with our Thor, Chris, uh, Chris Hemsworth. I have Chris Evans in my notes. My God, no, no. Um, so we see them team up to, fi- to fight Gore and save the universe. In a, another, yo, there's a pattern here emerging. In a random, well, kind of random, bittersweet ending, it's very adorable, Thor becomes a dad to his adopted daughter named Love. He's Thunder, she's Love, and she's the daughter Aww. of Christian Bale's character, um, Gore, uh, in this movie. So, my thoughts on this movie, a little complicated. I'm going to say up front that there's very little, if anything, that Taika Waititi does that I'm not enamored with. Mm. Remember that time, Raven, that he was living his best life say, saying, to hell with monogamy, I'm Taika Waititi. Oh Dan. my god. I I actually did not know when they were making this movie until I saw pictures of like him kissing both Rita Ora and Tessa Thompson. And I was like, now this Living is how life. you do a midlife crisis. Like <laughs> the, the red Lamborghini is like, it's done it's dated now it's like i'm going to date a pop star and a movie star at the same time which honestly the the person my basically person i'm yeah yeah it can't get weird there's no way it can get weird those are those are weird power dynamics guys no matter what industry you work in don't date your boss that's um that's a no-no declare it to hr at least i don't even know if you should do that honestly because like just don't date them honestly just don't like that is my big sis advice for all of y'all um and i think especially within an industry like hollywood where those lines get super blurry super fast um definitely don't so i get what you're saying parks and rec made it very hot very sexy adam scott being the boss but he he did step down real quick 
Uh, yeah, and look what Adam Scott did. He like gave himself brain damage so that he couldn't have a personal life in Severance. So shout out to Severance. Incredible show. Everyone incredible. Watches. Incredible show. Please watch it. I watched it. It's fantastic. I would say, like, speaking of Taika, you know, the he does, you know, he has this like beautiful style of like walking in between tra- tragedy and joy and the, one of the things that he's remedied which we've wanted as fans is the loveliest moments of the movie are like flashbacks between the relationship of jane and thor you know them living what together relationship and- they didn't have one it- in those first two movies it- i mean ah oh, exactly. come on <laughs> exactly it actually just like makes it like now with this new movie, it seems like you see them cooking food together. You see them falling asleep on the couch and watching like, you know, episodes together. It's just very lovely living like a domestic bliss, something that was very hard to believe in the in the first two Thor movies. And yeah, establishing the connection was very important to see what Thor feels now and what Jane where Jane is um now as well. And there's there's obviously a lot more shown with valkyrie having relationships with women and talking about love in general and korg uh mating with his husband later on in the film so there's a lot more shown instead of just just baiting and talked about before um and i generally loved the chemistry between the cast i loved the chemistry between natalie portman and tessa thompson just girl bossing their way just incredible just Handled very well. And then I think, honestly, the best part of the movie is Christian Bale as as Voldemort. I mean, Gore the God Butcher. Whoops. He, <laughs> he, he's Voldemort, guys. Was he like, he I can- want to kill mudbloods. I mean gods. Oops, sorry. That's, I, I, I meant gods. Ooh, I meant gods. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that paycheck now. Um, the boy who lived he- has come to die. Oh, wait, no. This is Thor? Yeah. Uh... I can touch you now. Was that all makeup? Because it looked pretty gross. And I know Christian Bale loves to it get was. gross and weird in his movies. So it was all was makeup. Like, yeah. Yeah. There's behind the scenes photos. He just he looks fantastic. Very scary. That's cool. Um, I'm tired yeah, of seeing people in like suits with ping pong balls on them. It's cool to see makeup performances. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He really came to slay with that necro sword. Incredible. Um, I would have loved to see more of him because I think there's definitely more there and it was a lot of the movie ended up on the cutting floor and it was still very long this movie I believe 2.5 hours but there's 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 at least 30 minutes of footage with Christian Bale just like doing his magic that I'd love to see someday Um, yeah the heart of the movie the main cast the two Thors together surprisingly the beautiful warm connection between the th- two thors has was was lovely now let's get to what required a little bit more baking in this movie so with with all of the poignancy in the movie it was all it was all undercut a bit with like with there's you know cuz there's this is a movie to do with gods obviously and and gore being on a quest to kill the gods we see a planned orgy of gods. We see a god of Val, god of dumplings, who's actually very cute. We see fur god, god of fur. We see, oh my god, we see Russell Crowe as Zeus attempt his best Greek accent as an Aussie in a toga. Wait, like Greek Greek? <sighs> like a Greek it's uncle like, at a diner? I mean, I think it ended up being like an like australian attempting an italian accent but also attempting some kind of eastern european accent it just didn't work and and then academy you know, award Russell- winner russell crowe y'all <laughs> also famously an angry man back in the day fighting around the world oh my god shout out south park um it seems, yeah, in general, the movie, you know, it seems like the draft of an essay, not the final paper, if that makes sense. At the end of the semester, like a lot of things are the jokes fly past at light speed while the storyline is actually quite sad, right? Jane Foster in the comics as well is diagno- diagnosed with cancer and because of the love 
Thor and Jane shared and Mjolnir's vow to look after her. She is deemed worthy enough to pick up the hammer in, or, in order to save herself from suffering. So while she's Thor, she suffers none of the pain, none of no consequences, and she's actually very powerful. But when she comes out of the Thor state, she's actually weakened. Um, yeah, so it was, while they tried to address it, I do feel the editing was a bit choppy and it felt like it could have been done better. But I do want to take this moment to address, like, the rush that happened on this movie. And in yeah. general, this year has mm -hmm. been, in general, I think the backlash against against Marvel in general this year has to do with a lot of things. Maybe superhero fatigue, maybe confusion that do the Disney Plus shows and my time watching the Disney Plus shows actually do they does that actually mean anything um and then some of it's just like internet being a scary place and kind of attacking different stories and different voices telling yeah stories. I don't I don't want to amplify that I would rather talk yeah, absolutely about not you the, know the, the big tangible issue problems that we do, yeah the big issue we do want to say is the controversy over the CGI. So as a quick recap, there was some criticism over the movie CGI looking a little weak along with, and this has been a kind of something that has happened throughout the year. This happened uh, when She-Hulk trailers came out, like a lot of CGI criticism, same with Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness in March, at which point many CGI artists and developers spoke out and were brave enough to reveal their names, right? And said the same thing in various forms. That Marvel has been an yeah. unreliable, capricious, and dem demanding client, leading many to be traumatized and leaving the industry and their craft. Uh, and to this, all we will say is Marvel and Kevin and Brad, this is not okay. We know you listen to your audience and your customers. Mm -hmm. We know you're agile. We know you iterate. This needs to be remedied ASAP. As product folks, we will shout it from the rooftops. You have to yes. always, always, always shield and protect your developers. And listen, we understand the demands of the business and the stakeholders and release dates are never ending. And we cannot even, even imagine the pressures you're under. But with careful planning and empathy and communication and consideration and honestly managing up, wonders can be accomplished. Putting the fun in Cross Dysfunctional. <laughs> Welcome to Cross Dysfunctional. It's where today we'll be looking into some of the leaders within the review aggregators that are used by modern media consumers. And I'm going to get things started with Rotten Tomatoes. If you are not familiar with Rotten Tomatoes, um, let's go over a quick background. Um, Rotten Tomatoes was started in UC Berkeley, Bay Area, baby. August 1998 was when it was started and it was originally made for aggregating reviews for Jackie Chan movies <laughs> like most what? products incredible yeah, yeah it had like a pivot because the founders wanted to see how Jackie Chan reviews were coming in like for his movies from different places and kind of um, making decisions on which of his movies to recommend to other people and it obviously grew from there. It is currently, you know, um, acquired by Fandango, but it has a long, complicated history. The website Flickster bought it in 2010. Flickster was then acquired by Warner Brothers in 2011 and then Discovery. sold. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was just, um, I think it was just AOL Time Warner then in 2011. And then it was sold, Rotten Tomatoes along with Flickster was sold to Fandango, which is owned by Comcast. So Comcast, I believe, also owns the Universal Movie Studios. So both Comcast and Warner Brothers Discovery have minority stakes in Rotten Tomatoes. So it is going to be interesting to see how that neutrality is maintained because obviously these are people who are putting out movies and um, that gets pretty murky over there. 
So it is monetized, like it basically makes money through advertisements. So if you try to go on there with an ad blocker, it tells you to disable them because you don't have to sign up uh, with a credit card to use the website. It is, you know, one of those technically free websites, but yeah, it's making Mm -hmm. its money through ads. And if you Google movies or if you look through Google search results for movies, Uh, The Rotten Tomatoes critical score is actually what's shown to the end user in those um, search Mm -hmm. results. So it's got a lot of prominence in being a highly viewed ratings platform. Right. Uh, Yeah. The user ratings are not shown once you Google a movie. It's only critics. Yeah, it is only the critics. Yeah. So the way that the... um, scoring works is they basically have a system called the tomato meter where uh things are either rotten or fresh uh like rotten tomatoes Mm -hmm. eh. the origin actually doesn't come from throwing rotten tomatoes during a performance it came from like some obscure canadian film that i have never seen which is cool i guess but I think it, yeah, more directly translates Is to, Is that like, true? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I always figured yeah. it was, like, tomatoes during a performance, like a theatrical production. Yeah, I think that's just a happy coincidence, because they just got it from somewhere else. Incredible. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so they have, like, a scale of basically fresh or rotten, and there's, like, a separate thing called certified fresh. So let's go through all of that. Uh, the tomato meter is applied to any kind of media. So if it's a movie or a TV show, um, the score is calculated after it has received at least five reviews. If 60% of those reviews or above 60% are positive, a red tomato is displayed to indicate like a fresh status. So how those movies or reviews like excuse me those reviews of the movies and tv are deemed to be positive that's not made clear it just says those reviews have to be positive now there's a lot of different ways that people sort of grade their movies where they say you know it's a four out of ten or one out of five stars or maybe even some like weird obscure like hippie school grade things like it's an elephant (laughs) or a butterfly there's no consistency in what constitutes as a positive rating so that really stuck out to me so Um, the tomato sauce doesn't have consistency (laughs) i've been saying this for a while (laughs) (laughs) yeah that shit is lumpy (laughs) um but there's another like elevated level of rating it's called you know being fresh and That's when you see something is like 100% tomatoes, but it doesn't have the little certified fresh tag. And Mm. the certified fresh, it must meet like a consistent tomato meter score of 75% or higher. So um, basically 60% is fresh, but 75% is certified fresh. At least five reviews from what Rotten Tomatoes calls top critics. So these are like published critics somewhere. And they must have a minimum of 80 reviews in total from both critics and audience. Okay, so there's some checks and balances at least. There are some. I think for wide release movies and I do appreciate this because there are movies that get limited releases in like very specific cities so wide release movies need 80 reviews and limited releases need 40 reviews and that makes sense to me because you you obviously can't get the same number of people watching it so I think that's generous as well Um, In terms of television shows, they don't grade the overall show. It's individual seasons. And TV shows Mm -hmm. need 20 reviews to meet the same tomato meter scoring. So there is some math, there's some checks and balances, like you said. But I think the biggest one that sticks out is what constitutes a positive review. There was no literature that I found online. And there was nothing that was 
like a concrete standard or a rubric that you could hold up to it. I think some cases are very obvious where it's like a critic that is reviewing something out of a score of 10 or five stars and it's like four out of five stars or nine out of 10 is like a positive review, obviously. So it's, it's trying to make a subjective experience objective. And I just don't think that's possible, but yeah. And if there is obviously from the, um, kind of uh the audience score side that's also pretty interesting um you are giving a rating to the movie when you are reviewing it um out of five stars if you give the tv show or the movie three and a half stars or above it's fresh if it's below three and a half stars it's rotten so that's how the user um, review is calculated and that's a much more easier rubric to follow a GPA because it's like, of 3.2 is rotten come on y'all <laughs> I think it's interesting that there's a deviation from the 60% positive reviews call- qualify a critic's fresh but it doesn't translate to 60% um, in the score of a user Maybe I'm equating it incorrectly. Yeah, maybe my math is wrong. But what I'm seeing is like, if a movie gets a 7 out of 10, that's a fresh and below that is rotten. But I don't know if that same rubric is applied to critics as well. A critic could give a two out of five star review and it somehow still could be connotated as positive. So there's it's very murky over there. Um. That's the weird part. (laughs) I mentioned top critics, which is something that is a special designation within Rotten Tomatoes that you have to earn as a critic. So if you are providing your reviews as a critic, you need to fulfill a certain amount of criteria. And it's not a mystery, those criteria, thankfully. Like you have to have been reviewing movies for a minimum of five years and you have to have an output of at least four to six reviews that you are publishing per month within those five years interesting yeah you gotta turn up that content you know i mean they want to see if this is your living or not uh because if you're doing it casually they're like we can't give you this designation you haven't earned it so you need um your website or your platforms with like a certain amount of metrics that come through with uh, DAUs and MAUs, daily active users and monthly active users, baby. You need 450,000 followers on Twitter. Please follow us on Twitter, guys. Um, (laughs) 500,000 video subscribers. Subscribe to us on YouTube, please. Um, If you are a podcaster, ding, 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 you need at least a thousand ratings with four stars on Apple Podcasts. Please subscribe and rate. Rate us five stars. Please, we want that sweet, sweet top critics designation. I'm just kidding. That's... Um, but no, I'm not kidding about following us on all our socials and uh, leaving us a ratings, guys. Please, that, that helps us tremendously. Rotten Tomatoes is about to do something around verified user ratings. So what Stop. is... Stop. They're going to add the green check mark. Stop. It's it's not the same as like a verified mm-hmm. Instagram. No, no, no. It's mm-hmm. It's actually... It's kind of interesting. What they're trying to verify is whether you've actually seen this shit that you're fucking talking about over here. Hell yeah. Let's do it. So motherfuckers be talking that shit about so much they haven't seen because it is woke, which means it has a person of color in it. Like literally they'll see a black person and go woke. They call Jurassic Park or not Jurassic Park, which was genuinely woke. Jurassic World Dominion, no colon, motherfuckers went out and screamed about the fact that there was a picture of Chris Pratt next to a black woman. 
<sighs> and called it woke. This is this, this movie is the opposite of woke. It is sleep. It has horse-sized locusts. Kira, 75% of the way tapped out. She is the most forgiving, accepting, loving, green juice, drinking, hippie motherfucker I know. And she was like, I've had enough. This fucking movie is the opposite of woke. And yet, because I, it has it a person woke of color, enough. Give me more wokeness. God damn People it. are just doing this to have that exact same effect where they know that audiences are looking to audience ratings and that is something that they can affect so they are going in full scale and they're doing this and rotten tomatoes now wants you to verify that you have actually seen this movie by selecting like from a list of drop down options where you bought your ticket from so this is again because i kind of talked about earlier how the audience ratings really matters when you're going to see a movie that you're buying a ticket for like if you're streaming, you're like, it sucks. It doesn't suck. Whatever. I spent my time. If you don't like it, mm-hmm. do your laundry, cook your pasta. Right. So it, it works out. And I think that this is just one step into like going into that direction of where they're trying to actually get audience mm-hmm. reviews and stuff. I don't know how successful it's going to be sometimes with features but I applaud like the this. Try. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's needed. Don't get me wrong. But with everything that we have seen in our experience as product managers, we know that there's only so much that we can do from a user verification perspective without like encroaching privacy laws or getting really creepy about like upload a picture of your ticket. Like at this point, it's just the user saying they saw it and picking something from a drop down list. So Mm-hmm. I don't know how successful it's going to be. I hope it is successful, but it's a start. Do we know when it's coming? Uh, have this year, next year? Do do they know? I'm no timelines mentioned. Of course not. Even Kevin Feige is giving us timelines of like twenty twenty six phase six of of like fantastic four movies guys we know they're gonna shift three months or four months you know as they have throughout the pandemic but come on put a timeline the world will put end a- in a flaming ball of apocalyptic heat and kevin feige is gonna be like marvel phase 71 is coming out. <laughs> we love we love a good organized roadmap guy you know yeah it's it's difficult to do that it's difficult to like separate the objective well-made film versus it was garbage but i had a fun time like what are you looking from your experience you know so yeah it's it's trying to like fine tune an objective measurement of something that cannot be measured you sometimes can't apply the scientific method to everything so that's the thesis of all of the, uh, the, the times that we live in. But yes, mm-hmm. uh, we'll, we'll discuss more. So a completely different beast from Rotten Tomatoes. Let's go into CinemaScore. So this is incredibly interesting. And I think as product managers, we're going to appreciate how valuable this is because it is explicitly a go-to market effectiveness measurement. It is a tool for seeing how well the marketing for the product work. So GTM, baby. Yeah, GTM. Um, So the go-to market strategy for everything like a movie or product is getting the word across in different platforms, you know, different media. And CinemaScore is a market research firm that goes around and sends physical survey cards to the audience members of the opening night of a movie and asks them to not only rate the movie from a grade of A to F, but collect certain other information that is constituted as like demographic information, which is super, super interesting. So if you look up CinemaScore and you go to their website, it is 
1998 Space Jam realness. Like, they don't give a shit about their website. And uh, honestly, that's fair, because all you can do is type in the name of a movie and see what its cinema score is. And what that is, is an effectiveness of the marketing campaign and what effect it had on the audiences being brought to the theaters and Mm. what impression that they're leaving of the movie uh, when they're leaving the theaters. So no credit. I didn't know it had a website at all. I just know of it like it releases its scores on Twitter, right? Yeah, exactly. It is again an incredibly basic (laughs) website. (laughs) Um, And the results are published in Entertainment Weekly. Um, They Uh, also not just work within the realm of cinematic release, but they're also an important part of understanding the home market, the rental market, Um, not just for DVD. I think it's just video on demand now as well. And Mm -hmm. they pass that information to studios who are looking to see whether putting something out on DVD or 4K Blu-ray, for example, is even worth it. So this is like a lot of industry-based monetizable decisions that they are involved in. So they give this scorecard art to people who are attending the opening night. And along with that grade, they ask whether the audience would like buy this movie, like own either a physical copy or a digital copy, uh, or if they would rent it. So it's a binary choice where they'll be like, do you want to own it or do you want to rent it? So Mm -hmm. that's very important because they want to see how many physical copies that they need to actually make for people. And I think with all this shit happening in HBO Max, maybe it's time to start buying physical copies again. So I think a lot more people are going to be saying yes. And then they ask you the reason why you watched this movie. And um, based on a very, I think, outdated (laughs) survey that I saw, some of the options were the main lead actor or actress, whether it was the director, whether it was the type of movie, or it was the subject matter. So they're trying to see what brings people's butts to the seats in theaters. And this is a lot of insight into how movie studios are making their decisions because there are some directors they give carte blanche to and others that they very tightly control. And this may be a reason why, where like audiences are explicitly saying, I came to see this movie because of this director or this person. And that has a huge impact on not only that individual's career, but how movie studios um, work towards achieving those same results with other people where they're like, oh, people came to see Ryan Gosling. We need another Ryan Gosling type when Ryan Gosling (laughs) stops being Ryan Gosling. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was Jake Gyllenhaal who actually said like, His experience of Hollywood was like, get me Jake Gyllenhaal and then get me a Jake Gyllenhaal type and then get me the next Jake Gyllenhaal. So it is very much in line with what I see in the survey where they're not actually talking about what they liked about the movie, why they're giving it the grade. It's like, did you like the movie? Are you going to buy the movie or rent it later? And what brought you here? Mm-hmm. So it's all questions around where they've spent their money on, basically. It's just it's very to distinct market. to Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, very distinct. Yeah. And there isn't a lot of room for saying weird shit that you would in a Rotten Tomatoes review. It's like, you like the movie or not? And, you know, at the same time, you have to answer the question about why did you come to see it? And professional hater is not on those survey options so it, your 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 review may be discounted as you mentioned because there's like go-to market strategies mm-hmm. tied to it there's 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 a different type of rating but i do it seems a little bit more hallowed anytime this is mentioned it's like but this movie cinema score was actually a so it's actually better you know like yeah it's almost like mm, rt I- we don't care Love to RT. But. It's industry people that care about it, though. Like, I yes. don't think you see yeah. uh, moviegoers looking up cinema scores because it doesn't matter to them. 
the cinema score tells the movie studio what worked about your marketing campaign and how it affects your release roadmap. And that's really yeah. just that. It is an it's effective tool. Early, early thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking. I, I don't know if, uh, well, of course, listeners can't see this, but in our notes, Raven has the scorecard for Cinema Score, which I'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. It's like one of those CSAT surveys we send out on in our day to day. Yes, exactly. It is uh, customer satisfaction, CSAT. And yes, yes. yeah, it's an older one because it asks you if you would like a DVD or a VHS. <laughs> and um, honestly, yeah, I would I would buy a VHS if I could of some things. But that's all it is. It's not meant to reflect the actual quality. It's like in a, a way of understanding where your mistakes were in marketing. Um, there are only 11 movies in uh the horror genre that have gotten like an f in cinema score i think there are 21 movies overall that have gotten an f so i'm just like okay that that means they were mismarketed and one of those entries that got an f was the darren aronofsky movie mother i could totally understand why it got that f because it was marketed as something and then you watch the movie and you realize wait this isn't what i thought i was going to get so same thing J Law said about her then boyfriend Darren Aronofsky. This isn't what I was going to get about her, her relationship. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I give Darren Aronofsky's dating skills an F. Wow. All right. Let's talk about another big one. I'm DB baby. <laughs> Let's talk about the little bit of background into I'm DB. So database of information related to films and TV. Hopefully we all know that. Uh, it's very useful, especially when it comes to bios of cast and crew and trivia and plot summaries. Trivia is a really fun section of IMDb that I especially love. This was started in 1990 as a by Cole Needham on a Usenet group called rec.arts.movies uh, with him starting lists like actresses with beautiful eyes and other which spiraled into other users of Usenet group just offering their like this is the actress with beautiful oh, eyes that no. I find this movie so it, it began in a, in a creepy origin yeah yeah Ho- as it went on though it became a little bit more prestigious where all of the people started offering like this is the definitive top 200 movies of all time and then it it was a very like editable list people were adding editing changing so it became about lists um and you know, in March 2022, now, uh, this year, it contains 10 million titles, including television episodes, and about 11.5 million person records. Very, very cool. That's a lot of people. Uh, it has 83 million registered users. The site's message boards, which used to be honestly super fun back in the early aughts, they were fun. They were a good, positive place oh, to discuss yeah. movies. Oh, I had the yeah. best time discussing The Dark Knight, like, right before it came out. Summer oh, of yeah, 08, TV baby. Was fun. Oh, they were yeah. so fun. And, like, more than ratings, it was just, like, fun to hang out and chat movies uh, with people. But the message boards are gone. In 2017, they were disabled because trolls and cop-out from moderating <laughs> on Amazon part, but it's probably best. Speaking of Amazon, Amazon acquired IMDb in 1998. And as for monetization, uh, as we've seen with Rotten Tomatoes as well, mostly comes, money mostly comes from advertising on its website app, as well as its streaming channel now. Previously, IMDb TV, now it's known as Freebie. The there's also a subscription model for industry professionals that is known as IMDb Pro, which is kind of like LinkedIn for entertainment professionals. Yeah, kind of expanding your network, showcasing your work, 
which is pretty cool. Finding talent for your next project. If you go on IMDb, pay, IMDb Pro page, there's like directors like, I found this actor because I was browsing on IMDb. I hired. That's crazy. <laughs> But I do notice that when you go to like an actress page, they have like their highlight reel and stuff like that. So it's, it is actually meant to be like a professional website catering to the needs of the industry. So that's cool. That's very cool. Um, So this is priced at $20 a month. So yeah. All right. So let's get to how, how these IMDb ratings actually work. So IMDb publishes, now this is a choice, IMDb publishes weighted averages rather than the actual raw data averages of their users' votes, and they're largely quite secretive about the exact formula that goes into it. If you go on Wikipedia, Wikipedia has like calculations, but I don't think that's actually 100% certain. Weighted averages simply mean that certain customers' votes hold a lot more sway on the final rating of a show or a TV or an episode or a show or a movie or an episode. So for example, if Raven is a power user on IMDb and regularly rates content, doesn't Mm -hmm. matter how she rates it. doesn't matter if she's leaving reviews that are object, you know, like just shouting or it's just that I use the product. Yeah. You are a power user. And compared to me, if I rate a content, you know, pieces of content like three or four times a year, her vote is going to count more than mine. Democracy in action. Incredible. There's a secondary rating that's applied when there is some controversy or unusual activity detected. And this is complete, they don't reveal what, how this rating is applied, how this rating is calculated, but there's a secondary rating formula that takes over in cases where there's unusual activity. All right. So sounds good, right? No issues at all with this approach. Everything is working fine. IMDb has mastered the sauce. Yeah, not quite. So let's get to the problems and issues with IMDb. So Most recently, as of a few days ago, Amazon decided to halt ratings for our beloved, beloved, (laughs) beloved Lord of the Rings prequel, Rings of Power, as we mentioned. Check out our pilot episode, Breaking It Down, along with Prime Video's UX and Tech. (laughs) Um, So yes, (laughs) so yes, they decided to review the ratings on IMDb for a whole time of 72 hours before validating and publishing and incorporating the new ratings because of review momming that's been happening on on IMDb and other platforms. Relatedly, this summer, they automatically brought down the rating of Bollywood Hindi blockbuster The Kashmir Files from 9.9 to 8.3 because uh, they said they detected a lot of unusual activity around ratings and they applied a an alternative calculation um which was not received well but at least they took some action now wired magazine wrote in 2016 that imdb's voter system has increasingly become a soft weapon in all sorts of online turf wars geopolitical geopolitical issues sexism racism you know well that's but in wonderful the in the good world. stuff the fun stuff because the, the parts about humanity that we truly love oh my god <laughs> another important and related data set here is that in 2017 mel magazine found that the regular users power users that we mentioned earlier are often male with an age range between 18 and 29 so Combining all that we've heard so far and the weighted average calculations, the demographic of the power users on the site, the type of content that usually gets review bombed and lower ratings, female led, you know, usually having more inclusion and minority voices and diverse casting. And we start to get a fuller picture of what may be happening on this platform and others. And, you know, I want to, Let's talk from like a product and tech perspective on on this a little. 
the issue mm. with IMDb's perspective is that they largely reward metrics that are very top level, which can be qualified as vanity metrics. So they reward time spent. They reward general activity on the site. Just like click, click, click. Doesn't matter where I'm clicking. It largely yeah. that vapid way to measure meaningful activity or encourage and teach and guide meaningful activity so i could go click around on the site and rate content and to imdb i'm a great user i'm the customer of their dreams i start to matter more than the other users on the site and perhaps this is ducking the responsibility of measuring my behavior and guiding my behavior in in a more you know in responsible fashion like ducking the hardline responsibility of preventative checks and balances then the issue obviously of the calculation of ratings the actual formula is is, yeah. is very flawed uh the weighted it sounds averages a, it sounds quite similar to like the way reddit uses the upvote system where mm. the more active you are uh the less your upvote counts Broadly speaking, that is the way that it ends up being where if you are constantly giving away upvotes, it's like going down to a fraction of a full upvote. Um, and that's the similar logic applied to downvotes as well. So if you are mm. giving a whole bunch of people downvotes all the time, your downvotes don't count as a full downvote on other posts. So the more that you do that the less valuable your vote becomes so i think the logic behind that may be convoluted but i think it serves to the purpose of where you're trying to make sure people don't abuse the system and aren't for example upvoting and downvoting stuff so maybe they're just trying to say that your vote in imdb counts the more that you use the product imdb which is fine, but then that for doesn't make product. you more qualified. Not yeah, for, for the their content. product. It, yeah. it, it, exactly. It doesn't make you qualified as a crit critic of like movies and TV. It's, I think that that application should be more around like the ability to post reviews and stuff, or even in the reviews that you see on, for example, Google Maps, where you read somebody's review of like a restaurant or something, you have the ability to tag it as a useful review or not. And I think IMDb started implementing that and that should be much more of a weighted feature <laughs> in calculating the scores because there needs to be some sort of multiplier that way whether it's actually an effective review or not. Yeah, and I think at least Reddit is actually monitoring. Like this user has given, like, like is always doing like, downvotes because blah 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 or on this type of content they're always doing downvotes yeah there's no visibility about imdb doing the same for weighted averages i think it it seemed to like from everything that i read it was just you're active on our site and we're gonna reward you for it it doesn't matter what you're reading content um or how you're reading content what type of content you're reading yeah you're rating and that's what matters. Yeah. And and that's where it gets a little bit tricky. And while I applaud IMDb for do like they do take action once in a while, they will, you know, they remove me message boards to, to really, you know, just kind of control the negative voices or the not the negative voices, let's say like the the, the toxic voices. And reviewing yeah. ratings after applying some, you know, the alternative method that they do, um, there's some level of credentials and verification happening, but it's not enough. And it's too, it usually comes very late because for Rings of Power, this was already review bombing culture was happening for more like two weeks or longer. And then they were like, oh yeah, a lot of people are talking about us. Maybe we should do something. It, seem, it seems to come yeah. from outside criticism instead of being taking more responsibility. And you have to also notice that Amazon owns both the Rings of Power and IMDB. So it's an easy decision mm -hmm. for them to protect mm -hmm. their multi-billion dollar investment. So again would they do offer the same level of protection to She-Hulk? It is also similarly getting review bond, but it is not a property of Amazon. So 
is there an incentive to do that even though it absolutely still deserves it it's not being looked at from a critical lens it is just people upset about meaningless <laughs> markers of dissatisfaction that they have because they're not seeing themselves on screen or other petty grievances that come from bigotry being manifested as online hate so yeah what deserves to get protected and what doesn't yeah um you know they can do so much here from from a perspective of really tech and product to protect the integrity of content and and encourage the integrity of content i want to see them put more resources into sophisticated algorithm of like preventative and early fraud detection uh, into ratings for this really bothers me for example there's rarely a time a massive amount of ones and tens should show up on any given content it really implies that <laughs> there's either blind hatefulness or a type of passion yeah. that's lacking all objectivity and ideally all objectivity in terms of evaluating art right um and it's never going to be totally objective, but let's let's be careful of those ones and tens. And ideally, the ratings fall somewhere in between these numbers. And to do this, they need to invest in tech. They need to invest in product that looks for this, right? They need to invest in an infrastructure and platform to verify. As you mentioned, Rotten Tomatoes is adding that check. And little things like, I don't know, I was thinking... Yeah, add add a ticket stub for theatrical re releases, but like for streaming releases, maybe they have a flag that's turned on if the the streaming release is particularly controversial. It could be like answer a question about like this character's name or something from like the first thirty minutes of the first episode, like maybe in very. Something like that, that's like, a, what is it called? The security questions that our banks ask us. Like, come on, like every every little website <laughs> has multi-factor authentication. You're telling me IMDb can't do some kind of stuff like that? But, you know, in a way, it's also like, I want them to use UX and copywriting best practices to actually guide the user in, in how to sort of handle and, and work with the platform. I want to see them communicate what their rating means. How I want to see them kind of walk us through like what how ratings work and how they're calculated. I want to see them teach me something about what I'm doing, you know? And so, so to encourage my passion, what I'm doing on IMDb uh, and gently hold my hand at first and then let let me rock with the platform and and... I don't know. There's a lot more they, they can do, obviously. There's, uh, I want to see, honestly, like more visibility into this alternative method of ratings. And I want to see maybe a, maybe a rehaul of this, of this current rating system. I also want to see this um, more visibility into ratings over time. I want them to, over time, right? Like, how do they change? Like, did it go from 4.1 to 8.3 mm -hmm. in the last two years? Oh, I yeah. want to, right? And I want to see, or from 8.3 to 4.1, you know? Um, <laughs> and this top 250 IMDb list of best films is, is um, this is shit, y'all. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. <laughs> I mean, if yeah, if, if they start taking just numbers, uh, I think like movies from India and China just have the largest number of people viewing them. So the top 250 should just be, you know, Indian and Chinese movies. And it's just that's ridiculous. crazy. <laughs> you can't it's... do that because you're not it's not a measurement of like actual user enjoyment. So, yeah it's it's weird again you can't math your way out of this one and it's also that list is per flawed for many reasons but particularly flawed flawed because it does not mention our modern citizen kane paddington 2 <laughs> anywhere <laughs> <laughs> oh where is paddington God. 2 i ask you <laughs> Oh my god, that day when I think some critic gave Citizen Kane a negative review and basically put Paddington and on the top of the like certified fresh list on Rotten Tomatoes. 
Film Twitter imploded yeah. in a good way because honestly it's like yeah what are these measures you know who is who is doing this to round this out i want to see imdb measure the success of their platform and their customer base differently the way the customers as we mentioned are rewarded for interacting with the site is is a little fucked up and there needs to be a, a rehaul of of this and honestly if they want some respect if they want to compete in an environment where ratings platforms are emerging as actually a little bit more trustworthy than they have been in the last 10 or so years they need to do better so bezos and needham come on my dudes let's do better yeah jeff bezos is famous for doing better so he'll 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 get right on that All right, to close out our ratings platforms discussions, let's get to my darling Letterboxd, <laughs> the Goodreads yeah. for movies. So, the all right, newcomer, before, right? It's the, the newcomer. One. All right, so a little bit of, well, actually, before I do the background of Letterboxd, I want to read some reviews that have been my favorites recent favorites, uh, which, you know, I read reviews like every day and I share them with Raven all the time. Um, and she shares them with me too. So we are endlessly entertained by these. All right. We so for the Batman. We each other's obsessions. We are a symbiotic <laughs> circle of life, snake eating tail. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So the Batman, 2022 Matt Reeves, Batman with 15,000 likes. <laughs> One of the top reviews. Gayest Batman ever. God bless. Top Gun Maverick with 9,000 likes. Completely gl- grammatically wrong, by the way. So picture it if you can. He go fast in airplane. And for our movie... <laughs> he does. He go very fast in fast airplane. This is true. It's It's true. And for our movies today, for Jurassic World Dominion with 10,000 likes, Tom Cruise would have used real dinosaurs. Hmm. <laughs> it's true. He the Grey actually <laughs> brought a dinosaur to life. It's true. Oh. I, I do not doubt his conviction. The Grey Man with about 100 likes this review. I'm convinced this movie is a loyalty test for Ryan Gosling fans. It's true. Oh, snap. <laughs> and then for Thor Love and Thunder with 5,000, with 500 likes, apologies, is Nicole Kidman was lying when she said heartbreak felt good at AMC. <laughs> <laughs> another one that i recently shared on our twitter please go follow us on twitter um where (laughs) it's a review for for the 1995 movie seven can't wait for seven two where someone kills seven people based on the seven bts members five stars (laughs) (laughs) oh my god i love Uh, a a very esoteric review yeah love All right, so let's get to the background. So this site was launched uh, at Brooklyn Beta here in New York City in the fall of 2011 by Matthew Buchanan and Carl Von Randow as a social app to have cinephiles gather and share their love of film. And this serves as part tracker of films and limited series, sometimes non-limited TV. And part social media tool where you can follow other members and interact with their comments, lists, and reviews. Company, the company today is based in Auckland, New Zealand, and also has a bomb podcast, The Letterboxd Show, highly recommend, which interviews Mm. creators, directors, writers, and editor, with editor-in-chief Gemma Gracewood. Letterboxd also has ratings, as we've been 
mentioning, uh, which are out of five. All of the data comes from the movie database, which is openly crowdsourced and has a strong focus on community and international content and incredibly active moderators. IMDb, while reliable in data, proved to be too expensive. And, you know, moderation is not not IMDb's uh, bread and butter. As for monetization, Letterboxd has three tiers for members. Uh, So they do, there's a free tier, but there's also Pro, which is $19 a year, which includes no ads, personalized pages like year in review in movies. uh, And then you can filter by streaming service. so, So advanced feature sets. And then the highest tier is the patron tier, which is about $50 a year which includes surprise and delight, very amazing surprise and delight features. uh, One of them being adding the backdrop of your favorite film automatically to your profile page. Tumblr style, very Tumblr aesthetic. Love it. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know that's speaking to me. And I also told you about the patron only feature that they're working on where you can decide which poster to use for your rating of a movie which i love because incredible there are so many cool posters of like the same movie in many many different countries and um shout out to japan they're always killing it with the graphic design on some of their posters like there are people who spend money on etsy buying the japanese version of the movie poster that of a movie that they like just because the design is so cool And you get to add that for your review. So when you're putting it on your profile, you can select like which poster it's going to show. And it's just a simple, really simple, like user delight. Surprise and delight. Yes. Perfect. And they've proven like they being the newcomer, they have chops in what they're doing in product and tech and they've strategies are very impressive to me because recently Currently in beta, they have a different tier for film creators, organizations, festivals, and critics, you know, such as Toronto International Film Festival and the Criterion Channel. And this tier is called the Letterbox HQ. And this enables these professional organizations to create their own spaces and have professional, customized, and unique experiences. They can post stories and links which can appear on their feeds or pin lists for their followers to to interact with. And their reviews will show up on these profiles as well. You know, I've I've been thinking about, especially during the pandemic, I imagine when critics are gathering, this kind of experience can really excel at connection, posterity, dissemination of information. You know, whether it's at Sundance, which was, I believe, hybrid this year, mostly remote, or like Venice Film Festival, which actually just um, is wrapping up today, I believe, which, you know, as Raven and I mentioned, has brought us a you lot of joy recently. You mean the Spitting Film Festival? <laughs> the Spitting Film Festival. <laughs> we spitting out here. Yeah. Shout out to Miss Flo. Uh, <laughs> That's what so I call yes, my lo- period. <laughs> hey so yes yeah i get my period uh, and i say don't worry darling so i'll I'll quit it now (laughs) good Good luck to everyone involved in this y'all yes so later letterbox hq genius move on on letterbox part so Couple more factoids. So during the pandemic, the platform skyrocketed in popularity among film lovers due to partly word of mouth from film journalists and critics, and partly because people were watching a lot more content and looking for ways, cinephiles were looking for ways to further their communities. Uh, It right now has about 3 million accounts with over 1 billion films marked as watched by its customers. So you know the feature that there's a feature where you can mark a film as watched. The Ringer declared Letterboxd recently as the safest place for film discussion we've got, mostly because, you know, this platform, it relies on 
qualitative aspects. Not many people are going for here for the ratings. People are going for the joyous reviews and and uh, actually yeah. having people right like in the smaller community feel. Uh, it, it really adds to the trust and reliability factor monetization wise other than the paid su subscriptions that i mentioned before it does rely on ads there's i am on the free tier currently and it is quite distracting uh the ads the number of ads that show up in like different placements anyway let's talk about how the ratings actually work so not very complicated it's very simple it's the average of customers ratings plain and simple it places equal weight on the critics' ratings uh, and the casual cinephile rating and calculates the number to an average rating out of five. The ri written review part of the site has drawn an incredible fan base. There's like Twitter's yeah. dedicated to it, Tumblr's dedicated to letterbox reviews, citing and quoting it's and sharing. There's quality comedy out there. Like a lot of people practicing really good surrealist and absurdist comedy dry observational comedy and it's all within these letterbox reviews guys keep going <laughs> it's it's great you know if there's something to be said about the joy it brings as well like you do feel you're at a party of people who love content like you're at a party and you're you're discovering you know it's not about like yeah it's a club of even, people who actually like stuff or yeah are very clear about what they like and don't like and don't see it as an objective measure. They're like, it's not for me. There you go. It's, it's Yeah. And like, even the negative reviews are funny and joyous and like something that you can shake off. They're like, hilarious. I'd still like, I like, I'd still They're like hilarious. to hang out with you, buddy, even if you hate my favorite movie. It's just very like, there's love yeah. and care behind these reviews, mostly, you know. Let's get to the problems and issues with the platform. So... You know, right now, I would say it's largely because because of the quote unquote lack of prestige and reliance, it doesn't seem to have gaping holes in its like rating systems right now. It doesn't have the same yeah. way, like people don't look at it the same way right now as people look at Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb. The thing is that Obviously, because it's a social tool, there is going to be negative activity, of course. You know, there's going to be always a corner of the world offering their unfounded hatred, you know, having their unfounded hatred show up on any platform that can handle it. But largely, that's been kept at bay at Letterboxd because of their highly moderated content in accordance with their community policy. So they do moderate the content and you know they're you very go. good about there's a, like read their community policy is incredible and they are very careful about keeping the community a healthy thriving place for cinephiles and and wannabe cinephiles to share love of content this i applaud greatly now all of this also as i mentioned means that you know the, the their writing their their ratings are not cited anywhere because they're they are not uh, as prestigious right now as they're, they're a little platform that could. There's something about it that gives me a remnant of like a Pitchfork review um, where if you don't know, Pitchfork um, does reviews for music, particularly within the format of album reviews by musical artists. And it's like considered to be one of those like cream of the crops critics where you know they're not really concerned about whether it follows musical genre rules and stuff is it like is it good will you have a good time and is there something worthwhile for it so this is like a kind of an audience version of that where it's an audience review by an audience who loves movies and the way that it's made and is making room for nuance in their enjoyment and in their rating. So I think that people who really care about movies will go to see the letterbox reviews of a movie, for example. And the casual viewer of movies will continue to use Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb. Letterbox enjoys films so much, they are not trying to pit creators against each other but rather foster collaboration and I think in terms of 
the other ratings platforms, it's always like a comparison where you're supposed to see if a movie is doing better than the other. And it just becomes this like sports team mentality where you're seeing Mm. if your team is doing better than the others. And this is not a sport. (laughs) It is not supposed to be that way. And you kind of get that combativeness where Marvel and DC fans lose their shit over Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb ratings. But Letterboxd is just supposed to be like a place where those maybe hardcore fans can look at what people who aren't invested in that sports team mentality think of those movies as a whole. Mm. And there are a lot of people there who are absolute pledged like cinema snobs and they still come through and say i like this marvel movie i like this dc movie i didn't like this i didn't like that they're like very honest about those opinions so that kind of community fostering where people are brought together by the things that they like or even brought together by the things that they don't where it's not Mm -hmm. based upon disrespecting the other people who don't share that opinion but rather it's more about finding the community with the people that do like and dislike the same stuff and saying, here you go, you have found your people, help each other explore those tastes and maybe even bring things to their attention and to their notice and help them gain a greater appreciation of all this other stuff that you're like not aware of. So it is a complete contrast to the other platforms that are just like team A versus team B. I know, that's very well said. Um, I really like that, you know, and there's, I'm sure as it becomes bigger and bigger, we hope not, but I'm sure they'll, they're going to run into some of the similar problems that other platforms have. And they, they can think about adding similar checks and balances of when people rate, like when, when is a rating more valid or when is a rating not more valid? When is a rating valid when it's not? Uh, depending on, you know, content of high publicity or scandal surrounding a particular cast or crew member or director, maybe fraud detection as well, right? Like they can employ, right now it's free for all, right? Like you rate as as much as you want, you comment as much as you want, but they can start to have these like preventative checks, preventative um, multi-factor authentication type type questions, And then maybe rewarding reviews that are meaningful to customers, you know, maybe rewarding reviews that have a lot of likes, for example, maybe rewarding reviews that have been liked by film organizations and critics uh, and pinned by them and working with feature flags, when to turn things on, when to turn things off. There's a lot from a tech and and, uh, product perspective they can start to think about when they do eventually run into these problems. But yeah, shout out to Letterboxd. Yeah, sounds like there's thoughtful product management. All right, final thoughts. All right, so today we covered ratings platforms some of the issues they're having and their actual impact on recent movies to contextualize what this means, right? Uh, We keep seeing this vague abuse happen or vague discrepancies happen, but we never find out why or maybe don't, don't have, don't bother, don't have the time to dig deep. Right. And personally, I've, to be honest, started, stopped, stopped looking at ratings the more people i talk to the more they're starting to roll their eyes at rotten tomatoes or imdb right they've they've just lost the trust yeah. they've lost credibility and yeah. and this is where product and tech can really lean in and win the trust back proper product strategy and tech principles and practices can really ensure that there's trust in ratings again that there's hope in watching content again, interacting with the community of content again. And, you know, this is very important because 
as people trust more, they're excited to watch more, they're excited to share more, they're excited to seek out more and participate more in this ecosystem of supporting creators and storytellers and honestly building a robust narrative around movies and theaters. Long live the theaters and and TV and streaming mm-hmm. as we slowly, you know, slowly but surely are emerging out of the pandemic. It's there's a role to be played here by these services and they are not playing it. They're failing. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Raymond? I I feel that there's many, many aspects to see within this the most qualified for me would be of course like the product side of things building in those checks and balances like we talked about within the yes. framing of how people use it and the context in which to use it and making sure that it is not easily abusable as a platform it doesn't become an outlet for a different type of frustration And there are many, many ways to solve that individually and from a systemic perspective of just uh, ratings as a concept within different tech platforms. Critique is supposed to be a net neutral term overall, and now it is just translated to like negative work. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of thoughtful criticism. I'm a big fan of media critique. You know, I go by Raven Ebert for a reason. (laughs) And I think that it plays an incredibly valuable role in shaping what art comes to prominence and what gains respect amongst the movie-going and media-consuming community. There's so many different things that I have been exposed to because of thoughtful criticism. And I wouldn't trade that experience for any other way because there's so much out there. Sometimes it can get really overwhelming. You get like that choice paralysis when you're on different streaming networks and stuff. And it helps to understand like which movies have been picking up good traction and for what you need that thoughtful critique. And I hope that it isn't demolished because the angriest voices are the loudest online and that there isn't anything being done to curb mob mentality thinking reactionary thinking especially when it comes to media consumption yeah Yeah, and i think about how it's all of our responsibility i when i say all of our like people who do have valid negative reviews about something like the director made a choice that was just like took me out of the story didn't work or like valid criticisms like you know what what have you that are not attacking for god's sakes be kind all right so with that let us quickly talk about what's coming up next all right so next time we're entering is fall y'all we're entering um spooky season time so next time we're gonna talk summer in san francisco I know it's coming it's your summer now it's coming up October summer in the rest of the northern hemisphere it's summer it's gonna be fall all right so next time we're talking about shutter scream box and the horror genre streaming takeover so we'll talk about maybe Jordan Peele Mike Flanagan maybe Blumhouse and rate Mm-hmm. Screen box versus shutter, and yeah, it should be a fun time. We're big horror fans here. At least, yeah, me, Raven, I, you like horror? I I love um the I love snobby horror. I love like weird horror shit. I'll and I don't do drugs, do so horror is my drug. This is like this is how <laughs> I singe my neurons. <laughs> it gets the heart rate up. Yeah, it's great. All right, that's all for us today, folks. See you next time. Bye, full screeners. Bye.